happening. So Joe, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Catherine, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank Catherine and Val for inviting us here and Techport for hosting this. Uh, what I want to say up front was, gosh, many, many years ago, I was a San Antonio College sophomore, and I actually spent an internship coding an RPG. How many people remember RPG? Uh, no, uh, one, two. Thank you very much for acknowledging your age here today. Uh, that was way back in 1981 when it was Kelly Air Force Base. I'm thrilled to see what they have done here at Techport. It's an honor to be here and, and to share with you. Briefly, I want to just let you know what we have here in San Antonio. I know Mayor Nuremberg was here earlier today talking about the ecosystem. We have what I believe is one of the most uh, unique and strong ecosystems in cybersecurity right here in San Antonio due to the fact that we have Air Force's cyber. We have an NSA mission here. We have a FBI cyber, uh, cyber team here. We have the U.S. Secret Service type cyber team here, multiple industry partners. We have strong academic programs from K through PhD that have grown over the past 25 years. And I've been fortunate to be a part of that, as many of the people you will hear from today. Uh, San Antonio has a strong level of working to together. Collaboration was mentioned earlier. That is what we do in this space here in San Antonio. And we're just thrilled to have, see some familiar faces who have helped build that ecosystem over the years, have continued to see that it grows each and every year. We have probably close to 5,000 university students and college students in the program here in San Antonio. We have probably close to two, if not 3,000 high school and middle school students here in San Antonio in Cyber Patriot going through their curriculum, if they can find it in, in middle school and high school, and participating in Cyber Patriot. So we're building the next workforce. <clears throat> I am the founder and CEO of the Cyber Texas Foundation, a local nonprofit focused on cybersecurity education in the San Antonio area, Texas, and beyond. And if there's time, I will speak to <clears throat> my work elsewhere beyond San Antonio. It's a thrill to be here. And what I'll do now is I'll turn it over to each of our panel members this morning and allow them to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Frederick Hall. I work with 690th ISS underneath 60th Air Force. That's my full-time paying job. Outside work, my full-time non-paying job is I'm a Cyber Patriot coach for Medina Valley High School and in Hondo through the public library. And I also mentored a team under Alamo Academies with the Information Technology Security Academy. Can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome. Uh, good morning. My name is Jacob Stauffer. I am the uh, Executive Technical Director for Coherent Cyber Education. Um, uh, my background, uh, I actually was uh, on this base and I was also on uh, Lackland with the 24th Air Force before it became 16th. I was uh, the forensic, uh, uh, I ran the forensics lab essentially for the ASSERT. Um, and then I transitioned to become an entrepreneur and uh, run Coherent Cyber and Coherent Cyber Education. Uh, and I'm also a UTSA professor uh, teaching digital forensics. So my name is Sean Mike. I'm the superintendent in Northeast Independent School District, which is in the northeast part of San Antonio. I am not a cyber person, but uh, the school district some years ago saw some value uh, in that industry and we've pushed in. So I hope I can bring some, a different insight here today. Okay, my name is uh, Bobby Blunt. I'm with the uh, MITRE Corporation, head of our innovation and uh, partnership activities. I've been working in uh, cyber since the early 80 time period that Joe just hinted at. And I'm also fortunate to be on the school board for our Northside ISD. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to have you all on this panel. Um, show of hands, how many have heard of or participate in Cyber Patriot? Okay, so a little bit more than half, so it doesn't look like we'll have to share too much, but what I would like Frank to do is to briefly describe, and anyone else can join, what Cyber Patriot is, the schools, the, the levels that it works, and the way teams form, who's involved, and the needs of Cyber Patriot teams. So Cyber Patriot is the 
nation's largest national youth cyber defense competition for those of you who aren't participating in the program. Uh, at its height before pre-COVID, there were nearly 7,000 teams participating worldwide. We're saying that overseas DOD schools, everybody in here in the continental US and Puerto Rico and some parts of Canada. So that's nearly 35,000 kids participating in this national defense program. And what this program does, it takes kids in, it teaches them the basic foundational knowledge of cybersecurity, of how to an operating system works, how to secure the operating system, how to create a network, how to secure the network, and how to find problems that are inherent to each of those things. So when the competition starts, because this is a like threat finder type competition, the images and the networks are already tattered with bugs, misconfigured, have things hidden inside of them that could harm a network or harm an operating system. And these kids cram into a room, five to a team, for six hours and try to find as many of these bugs that are hidden inside the operating systems and to properly configure a full-blown Cisco network with multiple devices, firewalls, multi-layer switches, layer two switches. I know for those of you who aren't too geeky, I apologize, but these are the type of things that these kids are learning how to operate, how to use, how to properly configure, how to update properly to make sure something is secure and imp imp impenetrable as possible from an outside attacker. Everything that you would see inside your regular work environment, your organizational environment, whether it's in a building here, organization or remoting in, which way everybody seems to be transitioning into the uh, workplace now. Everything, all of that has to be secure. Cyber Patriot is teaching that knowledge to these middle school and high school kids how to properly do that. And I think what's really cool is, is there is a team of five. You have a mentor, hopefully. You have a coach is, who is the teacher. And in most cases, that, that teacher is not a cybersecurity expert. That's where the mentors come in to be able to help them. I do want to add that that San Antonio has, has 346 teams signed up to compete this year. That is the most than any other city across the country, more than not just LA, but they count themselves as Southern California. So imagine Southern California, they had a little over 300, we had 346. For the sixth year in a row, we think it might be seventh, we've had the most teams register than any other city in the country. That's how strong a program we have. That's how much you will find school districts truly wanting to, to get into this field, to help their students, to just find one or one individual, a young girl who could potentially spend seven years from middle school to high school competing in Cyber Patriot. And if they wanna go on to college, four years in the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, the NCCDC and Cyber Patriot are run by UTSA's Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security right here in San Antonio. They are the engine behind, they do the scoring, all the technical aspects. I mentioned districts, and I wanna turn it over to Dr. Sean Micah now to be able to share his story of what a school district here in San Antonio, a rather large one, decided to do when it came to cyber. Thanks, Joe. How, how much time do I have? Because I get pretty passionate about I, I, talking let's about Let's say this 10 program. minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. So first, I want to piggyback off what y'all were talking about with, with cyber, uh, the cyber patriot. And, and the one thing I think that we don't hit upon enough, that as I talk to our students in, in industry, even outside of cyber, are what cyber patriot does, which are really cement those power skills for students. A lot of times we hear about them called soft skills, but they're learning how to work cooperatively and problem solve and those things that industry repeatedly is saying to us, you need to do it. So that, that program does so much more than just the technical uh, skills of, of cyber. But so what my journey really with cyber, and as I said earlier, I'm not a background, I don't know much about it, um, but I became an assistant superintendent and I was overseeing the JROTC program. So just a little bit about Northeast, uh, Bobby here is uh, a board member in the largest school district. I'm actually in the second largest district here in San Antonio. We have about 60,000 students. And so uh, when I took over in JROTC, my colonel at the time, 
took me over to Broadway Bank, right in the heart of my district, and showed me some students that were participating in Cyber Patriot. It was really my first exposure. So a lot of questions I had that day. He then took me down to a little corner of our school district to a program called the ETA. It's a magnet program housed at one of our high schools. And I was introduced to a gentleman named Josh Beck. Now, Josh, our ETA program has about 400 students in it. And so he was really impacting about 50 students a year. Well, when I sat in that room and I watched what Mr. Beck was doing, and I was starting to see these students, I thought this was amazing. I think the, the, the moon and the stars aligned because about oh, a couple months later, I was actually in a room with a general who was talking and said, you know, the next war will not be fought by land nor sea by air. We believe it'll be fought through cyber. And so all of these things were coming together and I thought, how, how do we push in as a school district? So we started to explore some ideas on this is a really viable industry for our students. So at that time, down the street from us, uh, from our central office, there happened to be an old HEB that then became a Walmart that came up for sale. It had sat for several years and no one was buying it. That was important to me because one of the factors was, how can I make this central, this program that we were starting to conceptualize with cyber? And it was important because Mr. Beck was really only impacting 50 students. Remember, we have 60,000. About 18,000 of those are high school students. So how could I bring this program and what I believe to be a valuable part of our programming to every student in our school district? Well, that building sat in the center of us. So I saw that opportunity. I started to see some barriers with as far as staffing. How were we going to staff cyber? Because historically, the school district really provided these programs at all of our high schools. It didn't take us long to figure out there was no way we were going to hire this many teachers because they just weren't out there. So localizing it made some sense. So what we did, and I think what was uniquely different, Joe, that we did, that historically I don't think educators we have done, is we really went to industry and said, help us co-create this program. We need to make certain that it is relevant not just to our students, but to the industry as a whole. So we formed an advisory board, and I will tell you, for those of you in the cyber industry, you're tough people to find. You don't really want to be found. But we found a couple champions, one being Joe, who really started to connect us with people in the industry. And so for about a year, we started to create this program. Well, it opened, and what we thought about was, um, how are we going to scale up? Because there was no way we could start with seniors. So we looked at the program, and we really thought about it beginning at the freshman and then moving its way up. So. As we developed this program, I took it to our board of trustees. I'm very fortunate um, that one of my board members is from UTSA in the cyber world and saw its value along with one of my other board members whose child was actually in cyber. And so they voted uh, truly unanimously to go forward with it. So we were able to open it, last year was our first year, to uh, 150 freshmen. Key though here when we designed this program was I often talk about the center, but it's much more than that because as we began talking with industry, especially to women, we heard some, some common themes. One, women are underrepresented. So they said to us, how is your program going to attract young women? The other one was, how are you going to attract students of color? These are two very underrepresented groups. So as we design this space, all of the color choices within the building are geared toward young women. We believe, and we have a saying in our school district, that you can't be what you can't see. And so the, the graphics within our facility depict students of color, they depict young women, so that these kids can see it. The interesting part as we were getting ready to launch this program, is we pushed out a survey to our students and to our, and to our uh, community, and we had almost no interest in the program. What we found very quickly, it wasn't enough just to talk to the students. We had to talk to the parents and show them a unique pathway. So when we launched our first application, 
We had 150 seats, we had 330 students. Our survey showed almost no interest, but by the time we rolled it out, we had uh, more than double what we could hold. So uh, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything, Joe. Oh, the other thing I want you to know is it's really a K-12 program. We knew that if we didn't expose children very early on to this pathway, they probably would not choose it. For those of you that don't know uh, education like I do, in the seventh grade, if you haven't captured them, you probably won't. They have already pretty much determined the pathway. By the seventh grade, they just say, I'm either good at math and science or I'm not. So what we did is we back mapped it down to kindergarten. And so this program really is K-12. Kinder through fifth is focused on robotics. When they get into the sixth grade through the eighth grade at middle school, they go into Cyber Patriot. And then in, the, in their freshman year, they can sign up then to go to our Institute of Cybersecurity and Innovation. Um, I think that's about it, Joe. Well, I, I think the other, you mentioned middle schools, Sean. Uh, the fabulous thing is you have seven high schools. Uh, 14 four, middles. 14 middle schools. Can you touch on what you shared with your middle school principals and on how they're going to be moving into Cyber Patriot? Sure. So, again, we knew that we had to build this pipeline of students for this program. And so K-5 is robotics. It's Lego robotics. But we didn't have anything at that middle school level. So what I said to all of our middle schools, all 14 is, my expectation is that you form at least one cybersecurity team. That was the expectation. Year one, we had 77 teams that competed in all sorts of events. It didn't take a lot of prodding. What we did is we leveraged our students in Cyber Patriot at our high school levels to go down and not only teach our students, but really our teachers. I think it's important to note, and, and this is what I learned along this, uh, this journey, is our teacher, Josh Beck, who really kind of chairs or heads our cybersecurity center, was not a cyber guy. He was really an English teacher who found that he had a passion for this and taught himself. And so that's what we went and, and really explained to our middle schools is, you don't have to have a background in, in computers and computer science. You just have to have an interest. We're going to help you get there. And then we built them a scaffolding type of way to get them to have these teams. Now, what, what Sean didn't mention is this little ETA, Engineering and Technology Academy, within Roosevelt High School, and a GROTC program became a powerhouse in San Antonio. They won. We hold in Cyber Texas holds an annual event called the San Antonio Mayor's Cyber Cup Program and college fair. So every year we award 10 or 11 different categories. My good friend Vic Malloy helped put all this together over the years. We award and we give we grant uh, trophies, in some cases scholarships from local businesses, but we bring in hundreds. We had almost eight, over 800 people just before COVID. Those students, some parents, the industry partners, our three-star generals, our CEOs all come together at this program. Roosevelt High School won, I think, five years in a row now, the top team in San Antonio at one high school and one small magnet school within that high school, and then his desire to expand it throughout the district. So Roosevelt was already a very strong program, and he's beefed it up at the Institute for Cybersecurity and Innovation. Look it up, N-E-I-S-D-I-C-S-I. They have the state-of-the-art classrooms, two security operations centers classrooms that are probably better than most companies have in terms of a SOC. They have two classrooms that have eight to 10 racks of Cisco devices, uh, two classrooms, and then they have other classrooms for, for uh, just regular classroom settings. And they have an unfinished area that they wanna have probably about maybe three quarters of this size ready, waiting for funding to be able to build an amphitheater that they can hold Cyber Patriot drones, robotics in that. So it's a fantastic facility. It's growing. It's, it's the, the, the star of what we've had over the years, the past 25 years to see where cybersecurity education has gone. I'm just thrilled to know that NEISD, your vision, Josh's English teacher background got him to where we are today. So Sean, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Anything else you, you kind of
kind of no i just want to take a moment joe and always thank cyber texas for all all the support you all have done we never could have gotten it there and uh, also to thank all the industry partners that we've been going and continue to bring into the building and influence the way we're doing because this facility is an old walmart and and if you ever want to take a tour we're always always open for people to come through because this space is very unique it does not have um, permanent walls. We designed it to allow it to adapt as that space adapts. So it, even if you just want to come over and, and mentor some of our students or provide an externship for our teachers, we would love for you to come by and, and visit. Absolutely. Please come see Sean afterwards. What uh, Sean, I don't believe we may have talked about it before the panel, but these students can earn how many certificates while at ICSI? Yeah, so Joe, they can earn up to five IBCs over their career. Um, so I'll do a shameless plug. We had uh, 150 freshmen last year as, as our inaugural class in ICSI, 100 of them qualified to take their first IBC and 85% of them passed on their first take. ITF, they will then take Cisco, I'm sorry, uh, CompTIA Network Plus, Security Plus, and a pen testing I think is the last well, one. Well, the fifth one is up to them. Ah, okay. it, is, it is totally geared toward their interest level. Fantastic. But we do have a Pearson testing center actually within the building, so our students don't have to leave to take those assessments. Yeah, so a wonderful model of what other districts in the country could follow. Uh, come see Sean afterwards. Uh, I help with tours, uh, so you can also come see me if you wish. Uh, but I love bringing people in and seeing them be amazed at the end of their tour. We're going to shift to the Northside ISD, the largest school district in San Antonio. Bobby Blunt has been involved in STEM education and cyber for 25, 30 years, uh, known Bobby for a very long time from his time in the Air Force. He has created some innovative STEM-based programs. He also saw the light in cybersecurity. Uh, Bobby, uh, I'll turn it over to you, but two things I want to make sure you touch on is certainly Holmes High School, Insight, and of course the grant that you all have with UTSA to kind of show how you all are building new teachers. Well, I just start first to say whatever Sean said, because he described it so well, those key factors and other things that, that make us, whether we're north side, northeast, and all of the school districts successful. I, I do want to re reiterate and reinforce three points he made, then I'll, I'll get to the specifics, Joe. Uh, first thing, notice that in northeast, and I'll say the same thing on the north side, it's institutionalized. That's always key when you're working with a school district and other programs is like you say, he's taking care of facilities, take care of staffing, really getting institutionalized. And what that means is extremely critical. You also caught on the scalability part. So it just wasn't one school that he talked about is how do we make sure that all of our students had that opportunity across the board and reinforce that one. And the last one was the pathway, you know, going from, I'll say pre-K, pre-K up through 12, and then we'll go up to the workforce are, are, are extremely valuable and extremely important. Um, just a couple of quick things to add from uh, from a north side and also from my uh, from a partnership standpoint. Um, as Joe knows, one thing that I always try to push for is really at the elementary school, and uh, the advocacy here, similar to what Sean was stating in terms in the long term. You know, it's already determined by seventh grade, but to get to the big numbers, it always starts, I think, with a big effort in an elementary school. North side, we've been fortunate. There's been a lot of attention from our science and our CTE areas uh, at the elementary school level. And uh, for example, we have STEM labs, check this out, STEM labs at every single one of our 81 elementary schools that we have. And through that STEM lab, those, those students are able to explore different areas within STEM. And we actually have, starting in pre-K or kindergarten, there's actually a cyber curriculum that has been developed for that STEM lab. So those uh, elementary school teachers are teaching elements of cyber actually starting at kindergarten level. We also leverage in that STEM lab as one other example uh, University of Texas San Antonio, the, the, their um, cyber threat defender card game series. Uh, I'm a big proponent and advocate of that. You know, they've got the, the cyber threat guardian, the cyber threat protector that goes from K through, I think K through second and then third through fifth grade. And let me tell you why I like that one. I'm going to push the other partnerships out there too. Think about it as a card game, which is very popular to students today. But their other aspect is, remember, not all of our students necessarily have computer access from their homes and other type places, but they can take out a card game. Or a teacher can teach that within a classroom to a much broader uh, audience uh, and grouping, et cetera. So that's why I'm an advocate of that particular program. But again, that's bought into our STEM lab. So we start from the elementary school and there's other efforts that are ongoing within Northside. 
I'll move quickly up to the, the middle school level. We opened up our very first magnet school in cyber at our Zachary Middle School uh, campus last year. And we have some 16th Air Force and, and others that are serving as a, on the advisory board for that. So what we realize is, you know, we, we typically talk about magnet and academies at the high school level. And I think Northeast is doing the same thing. But now we're actually reaching down and going to middle school level to have that earlier impact across the board. And then the one that Joe talked about, I know Joe is so proud of Holmes High School and the success they had, which really started out a lot of success we had in IT and the cyber and the curriculum and some other things. Uh, so much so that um, our new uh, name for our most four business career high school, now called Insight, is really focused on IT, cyber, and entrepreneur development, et cetera, as a big focus area of magnet schools. Uh, what we have learned is that is successful magnet school, but the other thing we're doing for cyber side of the house is we're building more of my way of saying academies, so I can have it in multiple high schools across the board as opposed to having everybody necessarily attending just that one we're developing in that particular fashion so that's another thing that's very important we had a partnership that joe mentioned and we talked earlier about some of the training aspects so we actually had a grant uh, with the university of texas of san antonio that actually um, the professors that had the cyber background at utsa actually went out and were training our teachers through this particular grant on cyber elements etc so that's one type of technique or, or methodology we use to be able to teach the students. So those are some of the things that we have going on with the north side. Let me do one other commercial break, if I can, joke. The, I really want to encourage our industry and other partners to really engage uh, with our school districts. And, and the way that you could do that, right, this is me talking. Typically, a lot of times we come in from the outside, we want to jump to the curriculum and develop the curriculum. My, my thought, I don't know if Sean agrees with this or not, is I would stay away from trying to do the curriculum development school sort of have a process and a way to handle that part of it but if you can help with clubs if you can develop new hands-on type activities if you can mentor and serve as advisors and get involved in that particular way i think it adds value so i just want that, yeah. that portion too absolutely <laughs> yeah thank you thank you bobby i agree uh, clubs are the way to start programs if you don't have a cyber program in your high school in your middle school it's an excellent way mentors are are needed in every every school every hopefully every team Bobby mentioned the Cyber Threat Defender card game. Maybe some of you know it. I know we're a long way from it. I don't know if the camera can pick it up here, but this is the Cyber Threat Defender card game. We were a sponsor, so proudly we have our logo on there. Uh, the cool thing is that any teacher in the United States can ask for one of these classroom sets. There are 25 decks that a teacher can get for free. They will be shipped to, again, any high school, any middle school, any teacher, they could be an elementary school, can ask for a classroom set by just Google CIAS CTD, Cyber Threat Defender. This is, uh, again, this is the pack for that was developed for adults. We work with Bobby to teach third and fifth graders five years ago. UTSA said they won't be able to understand the language. Those third through fifth graders knocked it out so much so that UTSA decided we need to create card games for K through second grade and third through sixth grade or fifth grade. So these card decks, one is just images, then the next one has images and documentation, and the latter is all about the card game and being able to learn about IT first and then learn about cybersecurity. Bobby touched on mentors. I do want to get to Jacob and give him his time, but I would like Frank Paul here, Frederick, to, to say a few words on what it takes to be a mentor, the type of people that we need in order to, to bring mentors and industry experts, as Bobby indicated, into the classroom. Yes, so um, for those of you who don't know, I started a Cyber Patriot team in Hondo, Texas through the public library. The reason why is there was a need or a want for kids to explore computer science, cybersecurity, but the schools were not offering it. So when I started this club, I was the head coach and I started peeing schools and other people around. Now, the importance of this is we're trying to get the talent pipeline built. We're trying to get from everywhere that we can to fill in these gaps. But what the big, big thing is trying to get the technical mentors. So coaches, you don't need to be technical. You just need to know how to organize, how to make things work, how to make connections for your team to do certain things. But the technical mentors, like our active duty in the back there, have the brain trust of power because they're working in industry. There is a need for mentors here in San Antonio because there are so many teams 
participating. Uh, to be a mentor is it bring your knowledge. It doesn't necessarily need to be technical, although that's advisable. You know, if you know Windows really well, if you know Cisco really well, if you know Linux very well, or if you know principles of cybersecurity and how to implement it, that will help the teams out immensely. But if you're good at organizing things, if you're good at telling kids, here's how you need to structure your team in order to compete, those type of things are also needed as well. Those power skills that you were mentioning, those can also come from your technical mentors. Technical mentors, like I said, don't need to be cyber specific technically. They just need to be able to provide some kind of help to the team and to the coach to make sure the team runs smoothly. I am fortunate enough to have some great technical mentors at Medina Valley, uh, Dr. Uh, Melissa Joyner and former Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dorsey Wilkins in uh, Medina Valley just came on as my technical mentor for Linux because Linux is not my strong suit. I know it, but he knows it a lot better. So those technical mentors have helped add to my team to make sure they're stronger in those certain areas where me as the coach and the mentor don't have that strength. So all of you out there, I encourage you to go to the Cyber Texas website find the link for mentors and for you active duty in the back. If you're looking for something, if they want to your EPR, your OPR for volunteer time, this is the perfect thing to give up to your command and they will let you do it. If not, please let me know and I will talk to 16th Air Force to see what we can make it happen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, he mentioned Hondo, Texas. That's a, I don't know, maybe 8,000 people west of here, maybe 10. So at a library, remember, didn't have it at the school, found a library. Uh, we actually went out in uh, three weeks after our, the Uvalde tragedy, tragedy. We went out to Uvalde to teach second through fifth grade students in IT and we had a cyber camp uh, at the Uvalde middle uh, library because of what Frank had done at Hondo. So because he'd done the work at Hondo, that brought us into Uvalde to teach second through fifth graders, the same classroom uh, age group at Robb Elementary were there learning about IT. It was a fabulous day. 12 mentors from 16th Air Force, from NSA, from industry were there to help teach the kids. I want to turn to Jacob. Jacob was, uh, I'll let him talk about himself, Air Force officer, decided to go into entrepreneurship, but while he was over at 16th or 24th Air Force, he began working with Civil Air Patrol teams. So I want Jake to talk a little bit about his CAP background, but then also what he brings with Coherent Cyber and what he's trying to do to provide tools for educators in high school and middle school in the field of cyber. Jake. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so Joe mentioned the fact that San Antonio has a very good ecosystem regarding cybersecurity, and uh, I'm kind of a testament to that because um, when I was at 24th Air Force, I was actually a civilian, uh, and believe it or not, Joe was actually one of my mentors, senior mentors, uh, while I was there. And so um, I got a lot of really great experience in the military. Um, and then uh, at that time, I was working for, or at least uh, I was a volunteer in Civil Air Patrol, eventually became a, a unit commander actually here uh, at um, uh, Port San Antonio. Um, but uh, I actually got my, uh, my start in Cyber Patriot. Uh, and so the, the unit that I was a part of at the time, the commander at the time said, hey, we have this thing called Cyber Patriot. We want you to get involved. And since you have the background, we need you to be the coach, the technical mentor, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so for about three or four years, uh, I was teaching the same thing over and over and over again. And I got to the point where like, we need to have a academy. We need to have something where kids can, can come from all over the nation um, come to 24th Air Force, now 16th Air Force, and, uh, and learn about cyber, but not just from people like me, but from the guys who wear the uniform in the back. And so that's where Cyber Defense Training Academy came. Uh, and, and so that program, we got uh, uh, the help from the 24th Air Force commander at the time, uh, General McLaughlin. And uh, uh, we brought kids from all over the nation. Um, uh, and when I say all over the nation, I'm talking Hawaii, Puerto Rico, uh, 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 Alaska, they were coming from all over the place. Uh, and, uh, and our cost to the kids was $50. Um, we found industry leaders here that were able to flip the bill for that. Um, the, uh, the United States government was able, uh, was able to allow us to stay on base. Uh, so the, the cost was very nominal for those students. Um, uh, but we wanted to have a skin in the game. So we, uh, we essentially said, 
pay $50, and then you have to deal with your travel um, and then come down. And so it was actually one of, the, it was the second largest program that Civil Air Patrol had during the summertime. Um, uh, and in the time that I ran the, the organization, uh, we had about 500 kids uh, come through the entire program. Um, but as a educator, some of the things that I definitely saw were uh, a few things. One, um, the, uh, the, the technical piece to that. Uh, you really have to streamline that technical piece in order for your kids to learn uh, effectively. If your teachers are so focused on technolo uh, technology and troubleshooting technology, they're not focused on teaching. Uh, the other thing that I also found was the, uh, the instructors themselves. We were running into a problem where unless you're a cybersecurity expert, you you were not a, uh, you didn't have the qualifications to be a cyber instructor. Uh, and so we had to find a way to, uh, to establish a pipeline of individuals that can come in and, and essentially be a cybersecurity uh, uh, instructor from zero to hero. And so, uh, uh, so then I put my entrepreneurial hat on at that time uh, and, uh, and talked to my business partner and said, hey, look, we need to have a, uh, a platform that we can teach off of. We need a platform that consistently assesses where the student is uh, along the way. Um, and we also need a turnkey solution to where a teacher can come in, have zero experience, and get started with a curriculum, uh, get started with the, um, uh, the, the different activities. The uh, So we have to, I mean, in cybersecurity, if you're not doing anything practical, you're not doing it right. So we have a, a bunch of practical applications and whatnot. Uh, and so that was the um, the start of coherent cyber education. Uh, and, uh, and and to Bobby's uh, point, uh, curriculum development is not easy. Uh, you've got TEA requirements. You've got industry requirements. Uh, the other thing, as a uh, adjunct professor at uh, UTSA, um, we always run into this issue where your curriculum is not up to date. And so you either have to update it yourself or rely on somebody else to update it for you. Uh, and so one of the things we've been doing at Coherent Cyber Education is focusing on the TEA requirements for, uh, for education, uh, but also marrying those up to um, uh, certifications like Security Plus, Network Plus, ITF Plus, um, also the NICE framework, because if you, if you have not heard of the NICE framework, um, uh, essentially all the employers in cyber when they develop their jobs, they're gonna be developing their jobs according to the NICE framework. And so if you have the ability to assign those KSAs and Ts to your, uh, to your curriculum, then not only are you uh, fulfilling the TEA requirements or at least the, the, uh, the area requirements, but you're also fulfilling the industry requirements to get those students uh, a, uh, a job in the industry. Um, and then one final thing I do want to mention, you, you did mention the fact that, that females, especially in this industry, um, it's, it's very hard to find, especially in this industry. And so uh, Coherent Cyber Education has been very lucky. Um, uh, we actually hired a, a former executive director of a CTE program up in North Dallas um, who is female. And she also hired a senior uh, vice president um, uh, of marketing and sales for the company. And really the focus of this was we needed to have a female face in the industry because we need to have uh, females uh, coming in uh, and doing great things. So Sari and Susan are back there. They'll probably raise their hand or, yep, there you are. Uh, and they're, they're actually the core team, uh, the core leadership team for Coherent Cyber Education. Thank you, Jake. Coherent Cyber, look it up. Uh, one of the options that you could you could bring back to your schools to help with cyber security education, which, as Jake said, is very difficult to start and very difficult to to maintain. Bobby, I'd like for you to maybe talk about your role. <clears throat> excuse me, at MITRE, the type of things that MITRE is doing in cyber and cyber education, and perhaps even STEM, if you could, please. Yeah, I think the main thing that we're really trying to do is um, establish and, and, and work with partnerships, not only within MITRE itself, and not only with the school districts with all the different players and industries that are that that are here in San Antonio and outside of San Antonio itself. Uh, just to give an example, I think yesterday we had a presentation on Project Xander, and I think that's sort of a good example of a partnership that I actually fits this realm real, real quick on what that Project Xander is and who's involved with that. So uh, MITRE, we teamed up with the University of Texas of San Antonio, and right now, this fall, we have 144 UTSA students that are in their graduate and undergraduate cyber programs. Uh, we put them in teams of 25, and those teams of 25 have a MITRE mentor, an Air Force mentor, 
uh, Palantine members and others that are um, have, have joined us to be mentors for them. And they're going out and do cyber assessments for faith-based and nonprofits in the San Antonio area. So it's an example of those type of partnerships and other things that we're that we're trying to get uh, get involved with uh, across the board and, and more than willing to continue those type of activities. Yes, Cyber Texas has participated in Project Xander for the, this is the third time. Fabulous students at UTSA. We're fortunate to have a graduate level student uh, base of four students uh, that are <clears throat> looking at what we do. Uh, at Cyber Texas and how we can improve our own security practices. Uh, I've also challenged them with a rather unique uh, idea it is to have them, it was somebody asked a question the other day, it was Richard Perez at the Chamber of Commerce. I know Jeff is here, it looks like, is that, that Jeff? Uh, Jeff was there, he had, he had a program called Cyber Charge with C City Public Service, our local energy provider. And Richard asked the panel that was there, all CISOs at CPS, Rackspace, and I can't remember the third one. Frost Bank, thank you, uh, thank you, Jeff. Ask the question. We call we have a, all this cyber education. We have these cyber programs. Is this truly Cyber City USA? And I, I've been we've been touting that for 15 years. Uh, so one of the things we might ask these students to do is to kind of scour what San Antonio has, so that we can do an inventory of what is out there uh, at academia, at industry, at, within the military, the associations that are out there to be able to begin to answer that question that Richard Perez asked a couple of weeks ago, asking students, some of them not even from San Antonio, but are gonna go out there and take a quick look at what we do have here in San Antonio. Once we have that data, they're, they're out there capturing data, we're then gonna look at that model, that data and begin to be able to put it together to truly show all the different aspects. We all are in this huge cyber ecosystem in San Antonio. We could have spent two days, I kid you not, we could have spent two days solely talking on the cyber ecosystem right here in San Antonio and expanding to Dallas, uh, expanding to Uvalde, San Angelo in programs that we do. I was even up in Idaho Falls, Idaho with the Idaho National Labs. Is that Bob here? Bob's here. Bob brought, took me up there to meet the uh, INL folks and meet the university and college programs up there and talk to high school individuals about forming a, an ecosystem in the cyber area, much like what San Antonio has. So that's what Cyber Texas is here to do, to help promote cybersecurity education from K to PhD, uh, focusing on competitions, education, curriculum, and just trying to link the folks that you've seen here this morning, folks that are not here today that work across the San Antonio area and Texas and the country it's, it's been a fabulous uh, road for the past 25 years to be able to do this. I think you can see the passion of each and every individual here uh, to be able to, to, to see that this is something that we truly are proud of. It's still growing. We have students coming up and each and every year the numbers go up in the middle school and high school. Thanks to Sean for bringing 70 plus middle school teams within his own district and knowing that that's something we can grow throughout. But um, any last minute type of things you'd like to add? Please, Bobby. Yeah, just, just real quick, others may have some. One of the things we need to think about, we're really gonna scale this and make this big, and y'all may kill me for saying this, we have to be careful when we just say cyber per se, because when we're talking to today's kids and others, uh, we have to think of it in terms of impact also. So what we're really doing is we're making the world even better, we're being more compassionate, now we open ourselves up to a much broader audience that are willing to help us fit this need that we need in the future workforce. So I do challenge us to really look at the language and what we're really trying to achieve if we really want to have a big impact. Yeah, and Joe, I just, you know, we talked a lot about internships for, for students. I want to also, if you don't want to work with, with students, because some people don't, think about working and, and, and providing internships or externships for teachers because that's what keeps them relevant, that's what keeps our curriculum relevant, and ultimately that's what helps us produce a great workforce for you all. Yes, thank you, gentlemen, both good comments. Bobby brings up an excellent point. Cyber, we can't even agree, is it cyber or cybersecurity, or is cybersecurity one word or two, right? So it's, it's, it's so broad, the, the NICE framework has, what, 54 work roles, I think, within the NICE framework, 54 different areas within cybersecurity. How do you tell a fifth grader who's interested in joining in middle school? How do you explain that to them? So, I, Bobby, I, I agree. Uh, you know, it is about IT first. 
right? You're learning about information technology and computers and networks. You need to know that before you can move into cyber. And I, I agree, I think that's something we need to think about uh, in terms of how we reach these students through these cards at kindergarten, uh, in, in primary school. Uh, I, I think just exposing them to something that what, what we're missing, we had a conversation before, we are missing students in the, in the disadvantaged area, I hope that's politically correct, the areas of town across the country that do not know about this and do not have the, the knowledge, do not have the, even the uh, knowledge that this exists and the knowledge that this is something they can do. And that's what we, that's why we, that's why we are here. We're here to develop the next generation of cyber experts and teachers. And we need more people. And I've heard it today. The three, two panels before this were terrific expressing what they're trying to do within their own communities. And I think that's what we're here to do is we need to reach Jane, who is a fifth grader who can spend three years in Cyber Patriot competition middle school, four years in high school, and four years in college. Who would not want to hire Jane when she graduates from college after all of that experience and all the education she has received? That's who we work for. That, that's who we're out there trying to do at Cyber Texas. We are thankful to have great partners that you see here today out in the audience. As I said, we could have spent two days solely talking about Cyber City USA and the things that we do here in San Antonio. So it's a privilege to have been here with you today. I hope you take some points back. Uh, we'd be happy to chat about how we can help. And we just want to continue to grow the cybersecurity ecosystem across our country because undoubtedly we need more of these people to be able to help secure our nation, our own personal things, and our own health, if you think about it. So that's why we're here, to make sure that we have a more secure nation and hoping that we can reach children, because they are children in these cases, in the primary school and middle school, to be able to find a career for them in the future. So I wanna thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you for, for being here on the panel today. And I just wanna thank again, Val and Catherine for allowing us a platform to be able to share what is happening right here in San Antonio. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Andrea Bonin Blanc, and I'm the CEO and founder of GEC Risk Advisory, and also a proud member of the Cyber Future Foundation Board. Sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm delighted to be here virtually. Uh, in these next few minutes, what I would like to talk to you about is the heightened uh, responsibility and duty of leaders in organizations. I'm thinking specifically of boards of directors and executive management of companies, of businesses, their heightened duty, responsibility, obligation to their stakeholders during these really difficult, turbulent times. As some of you know, um, I am the author of several books. One of them is Gloom to Boom and the annual Diplomatic Courier um, manual that we call the ESGT Megatrends Manual, uh, standing for Environmental, Social, Governance and Technology. And through these works and the work that I do for boards and for others, um, during the year, I try to nail down what I think are the most important multi-year megatrends that are affecting the strategy and the tactical decision-making of uh, companies, of businesses, and the oversight of boards. So specifically thinking about the cyber risk governance that boards and management need to think about. Let me talk to you for a few uh, minutes, very few minutes, about the five ESGT megatrends that I see for the coming year into 2023. The very first one and the most important uh, it goes without saying is 
uh, one that I call geopolitical tectonic shifts catalyzing. And what I mean by that is that we've had a lot of international governance, national governance, and corporate governance changes taking place over the past few years and continuing to accelerate and take place into the future. And we've seen that uh, most of all in how things have changed in Europe due to the Ukraine war, uh, the perpetration of the uh, invasion of Ukraine by the Russians, and the whole cyber piece that goes with that. Even though it's been quieter than some people think it has been, this is not an area to let down your guard. And as members of boards and members of executive management of any kind of business, doesn't really matter where you are or what you do, you have to have your cyber risk governance under control. The second mega trend is what I call climate and war propelling complex risk. I believe we live in a world of interconnected complex risk, and it is only being accelerated once again by these really mega, mega trends uh, that are the climate set of issues that we have, and of course now the war in Europe, and everything that that reverberates, um, the supply chains, the food situation, the humanitarian situation, and we do have other major risks potentially looming on the horizon. Third uh, mega trend is that tech disruption is becoming multidimensional and cyber features very importantly in, in many aspects of the tech disruption, uh, clearly more sophisticated daily changes, even hourly changes to the uh, attack vectors and the, and the abilities of the bad actors against business and against governments, et cetera. Um, and that's only going to get more accelerated with changes in new dimensions, such as quantum um, and also, of course, AI and other uh, types of technology that are enabling both for good and for not so good uh, changes in technology. The fourth uh, mega trend that I want to underline, which I think is really important for businesses uh, to think about as they're doing their work, especially when we're talking again about cyber and technology, is that stakeholder capitalism and ESG are intertwining. And a couple of the most important things that I want to talk about there have to do with how uh, cyber, uh, cyber stakeholders are really a very important part of your stakeholder portfolio, shall we say. Um, your uh, employees, your customers, their data, etc. So protecting that is super important because we are moving into a world of stakeholder capitalism. And ESG, of course, is the is the is the nomenclature du jour and there's a lot of discussion going on uh, both uh, you know uh, productive uh, financial discussions as well as not so productive political discussions but at the end of the day cyber resilience reporting <clears throat> will become part of this package of information that you need to protect and that you need to provide to your stakeholders. Uh, I'm involved in a couple of projects right now that are looking at what will cyber resilience reporting look like. So we have to continue to think about that. And my fifth mega trend is that leadership and institutional trust is recalibrating. We've seen many, many years of the decline in trust as illustrated by, by many, including the Edelman Trust Barometer, uh, many years of decline in trust in business, in government, in media, and in NGOs. But in the last couple of years, we've seen a, an increase in trust, uh, ever so slightly, but certainly an increase in business. And I think that gives business an opportunity to show some leadership vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis its stakeholders. Uh, and then finally, um, after I've given you these five uh, mega trends that I think are really uh, influencing how uh, we do business, uh, what kinds of things we need to do to do business uh, productively, effectively, positively for our stakeholders. Um, let me leave you with a few tips that I think are important to think about uh, as you do this. I think it's absolutely essential, first of all, for leadership teams to integrate geopolitical risk and cyber risk into their uh, enterprise risk management programs if they're not doing it already. Uh, many are not, and until they get hit with that big ransomware or other kind of situation, they often don't think about this. I'm saying not only the cyber piece, but also the geopolitical risk piece. Uh, continue to understand that the climate piece is gonna have all kinds of reverberations as well. So that has to be integrated into your enterprise risk management. And then I think it's so important to continue to do the things that build up the culture, the resilience, the muscle internally in the organization uh, to avoid the phishing attacks, to avoid the other kinds of attacks that we know are happening and will continue to evolve. 
And I think there, the, the culture of cyber hygiene has to start at the very beginning of an employee's life uh, cycle within an organization, and it has to be refreshed regularly and absolutely. And the board and the executive management have an absolutely important role to play here. I call it the triangular uh, cyber risk governance, where the board is overseeing proactively, executive management is, um, is developing the strategy, and then you have your team of CISO, CRO, and other uh, key players implementing cross-functionally and cross-disciplinarily, as well as across the entire uh, subsidiary portfolio of your organization. Also integrate a cyber uh, uh, digital chatter vigilance into your uh, portfolio of protection of uh, privacy information, of reputation information. I think that is so important as well. So I'll leave you with those few tidbits. I know it's a lot in a few minutes, but um, hopefully you can review this again if you want to or read some of my materials. All the best to everyone. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and thank Val, my wonderful colleague, and all my wonderful colleagues at uh, CFF uh, board and staff, and uh, wish you the very best for this uh, successful conference. Take care.